All right. Good evening, everybody. We're meeting with Amy Whitaker, who is one of the more fascinating, multifaceted, highly talented, very capable of expressing herself individuals that I've had the pleasure of running into. So, Amy, you wear several different hats, and you have a um, complicated his education or multifaceted. Let's go with multifaceted. Tell us a little about where did you grow up? Uh, I actually was born in Memphis and then grew up there in Birmingham, so I'm, I'm a secret southerner, uh, transplanted to New York. When you say and Birmingham, you mean Alabama? I mean Alabama, yes. Okay, yeah. as opposed to other Birminghams, of which yeah. there are several. Okay, cool. And then when you grew up, did you think you were an artist? Um, I, I have never been a person who suited the myth of artistic genius. My parents are academics in the sciences on one side, and um, everyone should have a mother who's a medievalist on the other. <laughs> but no, I mean, I actually love political science and math and a bunch of other stuff. Um, I, I sort of think everyone is an artist, and I, I've always loved art, but I also know lots of people who would never consider themselves artists who are very creative and curious. All right, so, so share with us your career path. How did you get from Birmingham to here today in two minutes? Right. Um, very non-linearly and involving a kind of uh, wilderness of narrative incoherence there in my 20s. Um, I went to Williams undergrad uh, following my brother there. I studied political science and art. I decided to get an art studio after college and worked for Jenny Holder and made drawings. And then moved to New York and worked in art museums and decided to go to business school to become a museum manager. Worked at the Tate, worked at the Guggenheim, worked at the MoMA, and then um, I was supposed to go work in a business job after business school, and as things happened, um, my plans changed, and I had a kind of gap year, and then um, decided to get an MFA in painting. Uh, went for it, and then the pendulum swung all the, back, all the way back the other way, and I worked at a hedge fund uh, for two years, as you do. Um, and uh, then it, it all sort of started to come together after that. I've been working on a book about art museums for about eight years, and I finished it as a labor of love project. Um, this is really before Kickstarter, but I finished it in this Kickstarter kind of a way with a friend of mine, and then um, went on. Do you have a, a copy of it to show us right there? I, I do actually. Hold on. Uh, I I thought I would I. I just saw Josh's excellent talk, and I thought that I would sit in front of my bookcase because it was entertaining to see him in front of his. Yeah. Can you see it? It's called yep. uh, Fatigue and Hope in the Face of Art. And I went on a life adventure and drove all the way around the country giving talks about creativity in everyday life and about the book. And then um, that led to teaching. So now I teach art business, which I've actually done since I was getting an MFA. So you wanted to address artistic values and marketplace values and go ahead. Yeah, so um, I got to hear the talk just now from Josh and it was just really inspiring kind of how to about doing a Kickstarter campaign and getting support for your work. But for me, he was also talking about a lot of these personal political decisions that people make that have to do with how they want their economics to work. So he was just talking about how sometimes he does open editions instead of closed editions, so he doesn't worry about the price point. And all of that is an application of kind of economic thinking and supply and demand, or more so deciding not to embrace economic thinking and not to try to make the work scarce for the sake of making it scarce. So I brought some slides if you want me to show them, or I can just Do you want me to give you control over the desktop? Let me do that. Um, do, you, do you guys want some pictures, or do you want me to Yeah, we them? always want pictures. These are visual right. people. Yeah, Go for yeah. it. Sure. Um, hold on, I got to turn over control to you. One second. Change role to presenter. That was interesting. All right. Um, Here my desktop, right? Yeah. There we go. And PowerPoint. Um, and slideshow. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well, by the way. First of all, thanks so much for having me. And um, Paul, thanks for inviting me on, too. So I guess um, to your point about my having a weird background, I was once introduced for a talk as a mixed up person, which is pretty true. And um, I guess my enduring life philosophy is that everyone is an artist and a business person. 
I'm very lucky to know professional artists and, and I have some experience of how hard it is to be an artist and to like log it out day in, day out the day job side, the art side, the creative uncertainty side. Um, I think that everyone has a little bit of that ability. And I also think that we live in the fast market economy. And so everyone is a business person too. And I think part of my purpose in life with regard to the arts is um, to say that understanding business is not automatically a form of selling out. It's another thing to be creative with. And it's another thing to practice according to your own personal set of ethics. So. Josh's ethics could be that he doesn't want to um, limit people's access to his art. And your set of ethics could be the same thing or something different. You could say, actually, I want to make work for five people at the top of the art world, or I want to make work in the produce section of the grocery store. And all of those things have an economic um, life to them. So um, I think it's important to remember that the founder of economics wasn't an economist. I actually think he was kind of an artist. He was a Scottish moral philosopher named Adam Smith who never intended to found the field. He tried to write a book that was a large history of the progress of man. It even has a whole section on the history of economics and the history of education, rather. And um, he was sort of spacey and impractical as a person. The stories about him are how he would go to the Edinburgh fish market and people would mistake him for a homeless man, but well-dressed or He'd have to sign a contract and he'd just make an elaborate imitation of the signature on the line above. And um, he, he was trying to figure out kind of how man came to progress um, and develop societies. And he happened to be writing at a time of mercantilism, which is to say nation state level hoarding, where people believed that to be wealthy, you had to keep all of your money inside your country's borders. And he advocated trade and that led to this theory of economics. So the reason I say that is that um, it's very easy to feel like the market is in control and like we are the pawns in this system. But actually, the system itself was invented once the same way that you sit down with a blank canvas and you make an artwork for the first time. And I think it's entirely possible that the system will be modified and reinvented. And I think even if someone wants to have a totally collaborative alternative economy, it helps to understand what we have now as part of the process of changing it. Um, so uh, these are the two slides on uh, regular market values versus artist values in reverse order. Um, so market values are completely foreign. You don't see them anywhere um, in the real world. The way that economics is modeled, I always say is like a cow and the way that real economics works is like a lot of people inside a cow costume trying to pretend to be like a cow. So there's this idea that everyone is always trying to maximize their profit or their utility, and that they're trying to be efficient at all times, that resources are scarce, and that there's perfect information, um, and that firms are these kind of perfect actors. And um, what actually happens, and what I see more and more, is uh, collaboration and abundance. So not the sense that people are trying to compete with each other to make as much money as possible, but a sense that you can work with other people and actually um, people are better off um, collaborating. These are pictures of stools that Asher Dunn makes at Kisei in Providence and he shares his studio with uh, other people, which actually makes it a lot cheaper to pay for the rent and all the equipment that they use. Um, so I guess what I think are some of the values are that if you're a creative person, um, you are generative and therefore you're not living in a scarcity economy, you're living in a sense of abundance. Um, and you're also living in a sense of process if you have no idea how if it's going well or badly. So you don't have perfect information. You have no idea if things are of value or not until you've already gotten pretty far down the road making them. Um, and it's very relational. Uh, economics is structured and the market is structured to look at objects and not to look at the environment. Um, so I always think of uh, Elaine Scarry, who uh, is an English professor at Harvard, who wrote this wonderful essay about um, the investigation of the plane crashes off of the coast of Long Island in the late 1990s. And she said that people always look at the airplane to see what went wrong, if it was the pilot or the plane itself, and that actually there was weird stuff happening in the environment at the time, a lot of electromagnetic interference. And so she looked at the environment, and I think Increasingly, if you're making creative work, you're in the realm of system thinking or ecosystem thinking where your relationship to other people 
is a, often a big part of the success of the project. Now, none of us would particularly know who Damian Hurst is if he hadn't organized group shows for all of his classmates. Um, so um, economics is all about decision making on the margin, and I think art is about this kind of iterative decision making where you're moving forward into an unknown, and that can that can really be different, um, especially because it's almost impossible to measure the things that are really of value, especially at the time that you're creating them. Um, so I guess it's really just this idea that um, you're engaged in a practice, you're trying to create things that haven't existed before, and there's not a lot of space for that. I mean, economics at base is structured around being able to answer questions, and art is structured around asking questions. And so it's a question of having to carve out space for yourself to be able to make the work you want to make. And I, I think also understanding business as a design tool so that you can make the space that works for you. Um, so these are the values that I associate with making art, which essentially boil down to showing up and being present. Um, this is a picture from a Backstreet Boys concert I went to with my office a few summers ago. And, like no one is watching the concert, they're filming the concert. Um, and we eventually got pulled up uh, into the crowd so that we were actually participating. And I'm not participating particularly at the point the photo was taken. Um, but there's a certain generosity required to be an artist in my opinion, because you're often asked to put something out there into the world before you get something back. And you're often asked to um, be someone who sees things first. Um, as John Maida, the RISD president, says, uh, a work of art is like a kite. Uh, the wind is always already there, but the kite shows you that it is. So it's just, I, I say that really to, um, uh, you know, I give everyone a lot of, um, credit and just a moment of pause and rest about like what it is to undertake being an artist in the world and then also in that same breath to turn around and ask your help um, thinking about markets and thinking about how you would want them to be designed because if we don't all participate in that conversation then um, you know we're we're sort of stuck with what we get I think so those are really the slides. I have some more, Paul. I can go back to them later, like some metaphors for how I think about the market creatively, but I'm I'm happy to kind of break it up and take questions or talk about other themes. All right. Well, um Would you like me to switch back to your you're having the desktop? Yeah, go ahead, or I was gonna try and do it. Can you do it? Uh I don't uh wait a minute, I can do it. I know how to do it. I figured it out. That would be great. Thank you. You guys are there we go. Excellent. All right. Do we have some questions? I knew Ken would have a question. Go ahead, Ken. So I'm curious about where you're coming from with all this in your current practice. You're, uh, are you doing a lot of seminars on these? You say you're teaching art business. Uh, what context is that happening in? Uh, I guess a few different concepts. So I I have a full-time job, like a lot of people, and I have a full-time job teaching art business. I teach at the Sotheby's Institute. I teach a lot of people who want to be in management and arts organizations. And then my current creative practice, apart from teaching, is writing. So I'm working on a book about business as a creative practice. And I also teach other places. I, I teach at the School of Visual Arts. I teach product designers. And then I, I teach in a lot of alternative settings. I taught a class at Occupy Wall Street. I teach at Trade School, the barter economy school that was founded by Caroline Woolard and some other artists, um, where you, you can teach anything and then people will give you um, something in exchange. Did, did you I, say you're teaching economics to Occupy Wall Street? Um, I did. I taught a, yeah, I taught a class called Stock Market Basics, and it's somewhat hilarious. There's actually an article about it that was written in Corporate Council magazine. I forwarded that I was doing it to some friends, and one of them um, forwarded it to her friends, and one of them was a journalist who, like, very sweetly followed me around and wrote about it. Um, yeah, I thought about um, the kind of context, the history of finance law, um, and a guy who worked on the floor of the stock exchange walked up in the middle of the talk like in his floor broker jacket. How big do you think this Occupy Wall Street movement is in the arts? How do you think it's affecting the arts? I mean, I hear a lot of people talking about it as it relates to an art. Movement. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're, so you're asking my opinion on Occupy. I, 
So I have a lot of friends who are artists who are involved in the Occupy movement, and I respect what they're doing enormously. I guess for me, the whole movement is an art project, so I'm more drawn to the movement overall than I am to um, Occupy museums or the turning of Occupy into a literal art project. Um, and I think that the like like with most people, like your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. And I think that Occupy's greatest strength is that it's a leaderless movement and a process. And that also, I think, is something it's criticized for because it doesn't have an agenda or people want the movement to have a manifesto. Um, but I had some really like interesting experiences going to planning meetings. And I, I really respect the way in which they are able to convert. I mean, there's actually like a hand signal for you're talking too long, we need to redirect. Like, what's wrong with that? Nothing. So, what do you think, Ken? I don't know, but it, it seems to have some currency in the art world. I, I think there was a little nervousness because they are challenging the Whitney Biennial and things like that. At the same time, it seems like the Whitney Biennial appreciated getting challenged and uh -huh. that something's coming out of that. And uh, it's affecting the, the next one. They're going to do it, but it, it is affecting it. And so, it's, I don't know, there's these larger discussions in our society, and artists are right there wherever these larger discussions are happening. So something's going on. Yeah. And, uh, so, well, uh, but I, at the end, it, it, I think it becomes a, a business strategy, too, ironically. The Occupy, you know, and, yeah. It's, and, and sooner or later, some Occupy artists are going to be selling their wares to the 1%. That's how yeah, it hopefully. That's entirely possible. All right, Andy, I, got, I have a really huge question here. Okay. And I don't know. It has three parts, and okay. and let's. I'll I'll repeat them all. But the first part is, what are the similarities between visual artists, craftspeople, and business people? The second question is, what are the differences between those same entities? And the third question is, because we're talking predominantly to visual artists, is how do they use that information to their advantage? So to start <laughs> with, to start with, what are the similarities between visual artists? design artists, and business people. OK. So can I just say one thing as a preface, Paul? Of course. I, I forget this sometimes, uh, that when I start talking about markets, people go, oh, man, she's a rapacious capitalist. And I just want to say, whatever comes out of my mouth about the way economics does or doesn't work, I, I care so much about artists being able to find space in the world. And if I really were a rapacious capitalist, I'd be working in an investment bank right now and going home in about four hours, and I'm not. Um, so I tend to think um, when you say uh, craft, it can mean two different things. It can. Well, you're mean, teaching design, and I want to deal with you know. Yeah, I'm, 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 designer, sure, absolutely. So I think that the biggest difference between art thinking and design thinking is that artists are asking questions and then answering them, and designers are usually tasked with answering questions. So a designer can be an artist, and an artist can be a designer. Um, the way that I would describe it is that uh, Heidegger defined a work of art as something new in the world that changes the world to allow itself to exist. And so just follow me for a second. That means that if you're at point A, you don't go to point B, you invent point B. So it's really, really hard to be at point A and to know where you're going. Um, you have to have a kind of sense of purpose or direction, absent a known destination. And that requires a, a, a real comfort with process being steeped in failure, uh, with uncertainty, with having to explain yourself at a cocktail party. And you're like, I don't know what I do. I have a day job. So I think that that is the kind of the bravery of being an artist is, is actually something that I have um, been writing about a little bit. I'll give you two examples. Um, Roger Bannister, some of you guys might know him. He's the first person to run a mile in under four minutes. British man who did it in the kind of early mid 1950s. 1954. 1954. Uh, yeah, if we track. Nice. Uh, so, so he, he, at the time he did it, people thought it was physically impossible to run a mile in under four minutes. They thought it was like a basic law of nature. And people have been trying to shave a very small, like nine seconds or something, off of the world record for almost a decade. He succeeded in doing it with the help of his friends, incidentally. Sorry about the uh, siren noise. I'm in New York. Um, 
And then he only held the record for 45 days before someone vested his time. So to me, that's the difference between believing something is possible, imagining it's possible and making it happen, and seeing that it's possible and jumping over a bar that you know is there. And that's a little bit of the difference between asking a question and answering it, as Roger Bannister did, and answering a question. So someone who beat him answered a question. Roger Bannister asked a question and answered it. And I think if you had to answer Paul's question and apply that in the business world, you know, entrepreneurs are the artists of the business world. They're, they often have support uh, from venture capital backers or Kickstarter campaigns or whatever it is, but they're doing that work. Part of what's so difficult, it's the same reason that we um, have historically appreciated the work of artists who did something worthwhile first as opposed to artists who did something worthwhile second is because we appreciate how hard it is. It's like the um, what in economics is called the first mover advantage. The first person to move into the field has an advantage. And in the rest of life, being the first mover is sort of like being the lead guy in a cycling race where you're like, man, I wish I could draft behind him instead. So I, I guess, um, you know, how, how to t use that to your advantage is to, if you were trying to be strategic about it, would be um, to figure out the areas where the question is something or the field is something you care so passionately about that you're willing to do the, the difficult work of being the artist and asking the question and then figuring out kind of otherwise when you're executing or finishing a project or essentially designing something or iterating or prototyping. Does that answer your question, Paul? Oh, yeah, but I got more. Um, and I have a if you ever want me to show more slides, I have some more on these kind of metaphors of business that relate to what we're talking about. Let's do it. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, why not? I mean, I need to close the window. Can you guys hear the siren on my end? Not anymore. Okay. All right. We did, when you, we did when you commented. Okay. I'll, I'll All right. I'm giving you back control again. Here you go. Okay. So share my desktop. PowerPoint. I'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, just to say that um, you guys know what the fundamental attribution error is in psychology? It's the, no, I don't. Okay, so it's kind of great. It's like, um, let's say that it's just me and Paul, and I'm thinking, man, Paul is really a rude jerk, and Paul's thinking I'm Thank having you. a bad day. No, no, no. <laughs> Paul's thinking I'm having a bad day. And what that means is that I am always going to think about something from my own perspective as if other people are fixed. And I'm going to think about something where my reality is not fixed. So, like, I'm having a bad day, but Paul's being a jerk. And Paul's like, she's being a jerk, but I'm having a bad day. So I think the same thing happens when you look at creativity, that when you're inside your own creative process, you're really in the weeds. You're, like, moving around. Everything is really subjective and changeable, right? Um, but if you're looking at other people's creativity, it's, like, it's fixed. It's a fixed external reality. It's an aerial view. It's, you're like, oh, the Beatles, of course they wrote all those songs, no problem. Um, and that, um, in some ways, can stop you from making creative work yourself because you're, you're not thinking about the difficult process they went through to get there. So the other story I was going to mention when I was talking about Roger Bannister was Harper Lee, the author of To Kill a Mockingbird. So the aerial view of To Kill a Mockingbird is she won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award and sold 30 million copies and it's a much loved book. I think it's number one on the list of what British librarians say you should read before you die, which puts it ahead of the Holy Bible. Um, when she was actually writing that book, she was a, a college and law school dropout who had worked for six years as a reservations agent for an airline. So you can imagine her cocktail party moment where someone, she's friends with Truman Cassidy, she's at this cocktail party, someone asked her what she's doing and she's like, I work for the airlines. She's, she is not yet the person who's written this book, but she is, right? So, so I think that um, a lot of, you know, it's, it's part of the difficulty of being an artist is that you're in the weeds, essentially. Um, and so um, I always say that there's two kinds of creativity. There's writing the letter and designing the envelope. And writing the letter is making the art object or the design object. And designing the envelope is figuring out the system in which the object can exist. So an example from the business world is Warby Parker. They make these great eyeglasses, but, and that would be the letter, but they also make this um, 
business model where they give a pair of glasses away for everyone that you buy. And they, they've managed to do this for under $95. And they don't just give the glasses to people, which would put local glasses sellers out of business in the developing world. They actually partner with nonprofits to give women jobs selling the glasses at agreed upon market rates. To me, that's a really resourceful, creative plan. Um, and there are other companies that do that too. Like here, you have to type something so that the computer can tell you're not a robot. But for reCAPTCHA, every time you type a word, you help digitize the universe of books. The same kind of material resourcefulness I associate with artists. Or this is a, a company called Oberon FMR, and they take food waste from manufacturing for human food, and they turn it into fish food. So they take something that a person is paying to get rid of, and they turn it into a source of profit. So I, I, I actually think this, this is a way that artists think that applies greatly in the business world. Business people would call it material resourcefulness. You're trying to kind of maximize what you have. But I, like I, I can't count the number of times I was in art school and someone would say, hey, there's there's a bunch of office furniture that's been thrown out on the street, and all of a sudden, everyone would be making art out of office furniture. Um, and you notice the creativity and the patterns in a lot of business models that we see. These are all examples of what are called freemium models, uh, where the, the business operates like a vast technological platform. So it has a high fixed cost. It has a high cost that doesn't vary with the number of people using it. Like, you have to get the entire software in place, but then once you do, you can add people almost infinitely without it costing anything. So the way they handle that is they they charge money to the premium customers, and that covers their overhead. But otherwise, they let people use it for free. Um, and uh, that also works because these businesses have what's called a network externality, meaning the more people who use them, the more valuable they are. And so it's in their interest to have a lot of people. So you, you start to be able to combine. A lot of the teaching I do is helping people understand cost structure and other parts of economics to be able to use it in a way that's authentic to them and suits their business and is um, advantageous. Um, so I um, found this great exercise in a Dan Rome book where he asked people to come up with all the possible uses of a brick. Um, and I, I often do this when I'm teaching. Uh, and the, if, if you're doing this in a group of artists and uh, it usually takes very little time for someone to say, um, use it as a weapon, use it to weight down a body in the East River, or something really dark. And then very little time for them to say um, something that's like super, super creative. Like we're always making chicken under a brick or using it, pulverizing it to make an exfoliator. And almost no one ever says build a wall or a house. And um, I think that what often happens in business or anywhere where you're trying to be creative is that you buy bricks because you want to build a wall or a house, and then all of a sudden you realize that you can't, and you have to think of something else to do. And again, this is the kind of thinking I, I think artists are exceptionally good at, is how to be resourceful with what you have. So Google is an example of this. They started as a search algorithm, had no intention of starting a company, but they couldn't sell it. No one would buy the program. They said search is dead. And so they took the brick and made it into something else, which I think we're all pretty familiar with. Um, and DuPont is another example, too. They originally made uh, gunpowder. And the reason they did it was because the DuPont brothers came over from France, liked to go hunting, knew the chemist Lavoisier, knew how to make good gunpowder, and went for it. And they did not intend to one day become the miracle of science company that um, we all know because anything that we are wearing that stretches or anything we cook on that's easy to clean is basically made by DuPont. So I think that this is just a, a reminder that the same kind of process, that same thing that happens when you make a work of art and you have a perfect idea in your head of what it's going to be and you get halfway through and you're like, this is not what I expected at all and what matters is from there to the end. That same thing happens in, I think, lots of different parts of life. And so what you really have to know is what your lighthouse is, like what the thing is that you're heading toward. And if in the absence of, of these execution-like, you know, business-like targets um, where you know the outcome and you just have to get there, like if you're really just inventing the outcome, then the most important thing is the questions that guide you on your way there. And I would refer to these as the MDQ, uh, which in a screenplay is the um, major dramatic question. For example, um, 
can men and women really be friends, is the major dramatic question underneath what will happen between Harry and Sally. Or can love transcend age is what the question is in Harold and Maude, um, even though you're really working at the level of the character. So kind of what what's your big question? Like what's the thing that you really care about that you, it's big enough that you can't yet answer it, and that's the question that pulls you forward. And then you iterate as you get pulled forward, and that's how you invent a series of point Bs. And, you know, who knows? Um, so I guess the last thing that I was going to say that's a metaphor of business is just that, um, so when I first went to business school, I had this conversation with my aunt. My aunt is a retired professor of performance studies, and it was about stories and numbers and which one is more important. And I was right at the beginning of studying business, so I thought numbers were more important than anything else, that you, know, you could solve anything in the world with numbers. And my aunt took me to the local senior center where her friend Vera, this very sprightly, amazing 80-year-old, was singing New York, New York and doing high leg kicks uh, as part of a performance that my aunt had put on with um, the senior center people and her college age students. And my aunt wrote a one page story about it and I would have given her all of the money I had to support the project. Um, and it, it made me think that stories are always more important than numbers. I think this is a Kickstarter truth as well. Um, and on the flip side, I actually think that a lot of business is stories that um, even in the most complicated equations, like the most complicated finance equations I teach, there's always one number that's completely made up. In the equations I'm talking about, it's the discount rate or the risk-free rate. It's, it's what you think you could make in a financial return if you weren't doing the project that you're choosing to do. And that's the story. So I, I say that really just to um, try to make business not seem like such an alien and foreign language, but just one part. It's, business is sort of like the engineering or the um, scaffolding uh, underneath the facade and the design of a building. And I mean, I think artists are more equipped than anybody to design the building in an interesting way once given all of those building blocks. So, well, that's really all I wanted to go through. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, I, so back I, have, to the, I have more questions. Hold on. Great, here. Excellent. Um, um, I'm going to close this window just in case. Excuse me. Okay. Okay, I'm ready. Oops, I went the wrong way. Um, so I, I feel like, you know, I don't, I don't want to use, hold on, I'm doing it. Okay. I don't want to use the analogy that um, says that artists are in the weeds, but, you know, a, a lot of the times I think visual artists can't necessarily see the forest for the trees. And, you know, we in the visual art world kind of exist in a microcosm. And I want you to help establish the context. Put on your not artist hat and put on your business, your business hat and the bigger one than that. And tell me where visual art and art in general and culture fits into, let's start with American society and then we'll go global. Okay. I just love these are huge questions. So um, I mentioned earlier that my mother is a medievalist and my father was a neurologist. And someone asked him once how they got along being in such different fields. And he said that he was in the business of saving lives, but she was in the business of making lives worth saving. And the irony of that statement was that actually he worked on quality of life issues like people with debilitating headaches or people who couldn't walk because of nerve damage. And my mother worked on what I consider to be basic life survival skills, like writing in complete sentences. And so I actually think that art and business or art and society have a similar relationship, that they're the things that you need that make it possible to live, and they're the things that you need because they make it worthwhile to live. And art is, is often framed in this leisure way, so it's not as necessity and as leisure, but I actually think that um, the same kind of creativity that happens in art is what ends up fueling the economy. So, for example, um, half of GDP growth in the U.S. and the U.K. occurred by innovation, and so to me, there's, 
there are two different ways that art exists in the world in relation to your question, Paul. And one of them is that art doesn't have to do anything. Art is impractical and immeasurable and open-ended and doesn't need to be defined and doesn't need to be given a purpose. It doesn't need to be in schools because it makes math SAT scores better. It just is. But what it is, is a part of what it means to be a person and to be alive and is very, very basic um, and useful in that way, useful by not being useful. And then also there's a way in which art is incredibly practical because it represents this kind of um, innovation that moves society forward. I often ask myself the question, if Leonardo da Vinci were alive today, what would he be doing? And I don't think he would be an artist in the modern sense. So I actually think that we'd be better off if we um, defined art more broadly. It, not taking anything away from anyone who's working as a professional artist now, but if we expanded the category, I think it would actually lend meaning to professional artistry and um, would invite other people in. You would see more of a relationship between Da Vinci and Elon Musk. Tell me more about why about Elon Musk. I can't remember everything. He's the guy who's do it, building the Tesla auto. He's the guy who's totally. um, getting building a what a private spaceship and travel to other planets. Um, mm -hmm. I think those are big risks and rather artistic. They are. I mean, I think it's interesting. He's that the Tesla or spaceship project is a bit like being Leonardo da Vinci and the Medici all at the same time because it's privately funded. True. Um, but it's, I think it's more that I wish there were a bigger conversation. I wish that, um, you know, people who are doing really creative work in the medical sciences were also talking to people who are doing creative work in the art. We're also talking to people doing creative work between two and four while they have to entertain their children. But, all right, but I, I contend that Americans are not particularly culture appreciative especially compared to Europeans. And I'm not quite clear on why that is. But but America tends, by which I mean the United States, tends to have a higher, or I don't know higher, a high level of entrepreneurship. Right, right. Well, and I, 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 one would think that they would both be elevated as opposed to one elevated more than the other. I, I don't know. Let's, let's change it. Because I think we have a lot of creati creative artistry but I don't think we have as much appreciation of culture as we do an appreciation of entrepreneurship. That's true. No, I think that Americans, I'm grossly done. I don't know why. We're, we're participators. The difference <laughs> between participation and appreciation is that if you're European, they're the same thing, that you're appreciating your, your own cultural legacy. And I, I think it's tiring to appreciate things. I think it's energizing to participate and to make things. I mean, you stand in front of a work of art in a museum, and it can be amazing and wonderful, but it can also be like a cocktail party where you have to keep saying, oh, how fascinating to someone telling you a really long story. What? <clears throat> All right, so, so let's I mean, accept that. There's like a difference between an art historical <laughs> and a visual artist mindset. And um I, I think I think it's also um, a particularly American, almost puritanical heritage of things needing to be productive. A uh, Calvinist work ethic, um, the idea that um, entrepreneurship is to do something functional in the world and that art isn't. Maybe maybe people are uncomfortable with that. I I don't know. Okay. Is that for you at all, or does that? Let's say that again. Does that resonate for you at all? Yeah. Um, but I want to shift gears again slightly. Let's accept that. What do visual artists do to attain greater cultural success? And, you know, a lot of these folks are interested in monetary success, too. So we don't want to rule that out. But, you know, given the description, given your comprehension of the lay of the land, what do visual artists do to more successfully navigate that? Um, I, I think that a lot of the ways that people build audiences are really inverted. 
I think we live in a funny age where it used to be that if you wanted to own information, you had to hoard it. And now if you want to own information, you have to put it out there. And I think that there's a way, it's very easy, and I, I probably have the same feeling myself as a writer, it's very easy to want to be discovered, to have someone give you a stamp of approval, to therefore be paid a lot of money and to be given a perch. Uh, and I think there's a transaction there where it's like someone else is pulling you up. And I see a lot of people succeed um, because they're, in, they're trying to put something out there or offer something up. And there's some way in which the kind of flow of energy gets reversed when that happens. And I'm sounding new agey, but I think more, more is possible. There's some, there's some like um, sort of deeply miserly instinct to feel that you can get discovered as opposed to feeling like you can build something. I, I go back to someone like Damien Hurst. If people are interested in financial success, he is reputed to, to have a net worth of about $350 million. And Damien Hurst didn't take his portfolio and go to a bunch of galleries and say, you should represent my work. He looked around at his friends. He said, it'd be fun if we all put an art show together. And then he did all the work to make it happen. Now, he is also, I'm sure, you know, gifted at connecting with people and was able to get Charles Sachi to support making the first shark in, in the formaldehyde tank. Um, you guys know the title of that work, The um, Unimaginability of Death in the Mind of the Living, phrased otherwise. And so he, he ended up being able to be a champion of his own cause, but he did it a little bit indirectly. And I think you see this a lot. I think there are ways that people succeed in a, at a smaller scale by being really transactional and going out there and saying, I want you to sell my work and, and sort of being grabby. But I think that all of these big mythic stories, like the Facebooks of our time, if you saw the social network movie, there, there are cases where someone was trying to do something that was a little bit bigger than themselves. They hung out without trying to monetize it immediately, and then it grew a, a little. So they, they had to let go slightly. They had to try and try and try and their effort led to the outcome that they had to give a, create a little space there. And I don't know if that's helpful. I know people probably want me to say, here's exactly how you earn $2 million a year on your art. Um, but I think, um, I, I, believe in, I believe in leaving that space for, I think that's what art is, you know, like leaving a little bit of space um, and trying to, you know, leave the world a little bit better than you found it. If you're an artist, you, I think you're in a position to make a contribution quite literally. And it's when you make a contribution that you get something back. Sweet. All right. Abra, you have a comment or question? Go ahead. Great. I'm, I'm, let me unmute you. There you go. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually like, uh, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks. I, I noticed something that you had put in your PowerPoint presentation. It was number five. It's um, what is important cannot be measured. And I, I can't help but think that, 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 yes, that's a great idea, and that may be true. But how is that going to apply in a recession? And I, I'm a writer, and I write for artists, and I write for other people, and I'm constantly running into a problem that I have to convince somebody that something that can't be measured but is of value is is not only, um, I'm, I'm constantly trying to convince people that something that's value is not tangible, is not only worthwhile, but put it in terms that are financial terms. And I noticed that you just said that, that Damien Hurst's his, his ideology was not um, go to um, galleries and ask to be funded, but let's get together and do something because it'll be fun. Do you think that that's still a mentality that is, viable during an economic recession, or is that something that has to be worked around, and if so, how would one work around that, when when everything has to actually have a price put on it, Right. in my right. opinion? Right. Yeah. So, does uh, that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does make sense. I mean, I think that, um, you know, everyone has to make a living. We live in an economy. As I think it was Flaubert said that to have a truly avant-garde practice, you need a certain level of bourgeois stability. So I, I completely respect the need to earn a living, and I am humbled seeing people earn a living who, you know, have, like, were at the store across the street from where I live during the storm um, all night because that's their job. Um, 
So I guess I would say you're, if I were applying the logic of Damien Hurst, um, and, and I don't know enough about your situation, so take this with a grain of salt, I would say that um, you're having to convince people to take you on as a freelancer, first of all, is really hard because a lot of publishing is broken right now, and freelancers are like the adjunct faculty of the um, publishing world. But I would say, like, why not think bigger? Like, why not start a publication and, and shift from the side of supplying your work to the side of demanding your work and try to, if you believe that you're making work of quality, um, then ask yourself if you can separate out the need to make a living and do something else to make a living and then make the writing your art and do it otherwise and try and try to make a platform that you own. So you see, you're putting the thought out there and you own it. Um, so it becomes like, like a, Try to make it a destination. Try to get other people who are in your same situation, whose writing you really value, um, to also put stuff on the site. And instead of being paid a paycheck for those articles, and I get it, like being paid a paycheck for articles is really nice, you would, you would own equity in, in what you were creating. So you would be like an entrepreneur. And if that thought fills you with horror or sounds really scary, then I would say either there's a risk tolerance required by Damien Hurst or entrepreneurs is uncomfortable for a lot of us, or maybe you're questioning the idea and you're, you're trying to figure out what, what it is exactly that you're, you're really hoping to do. Hold on. Abe, Abra, you want to respond? I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm actually, I'm not asking on behalf of myself. Um, I, I, I'm, I freelance on behalf of other people, and, and, and I write publicity materials, and I write press releases. Um, but my, my own writing is, is a different subject, but I'm, I'm, I, what I mean, I'm struggling, I'm, I'm struggling with how to present the work of um, art as something that inherently has an intangible value to a society that's in, in a recession in which everything has a price put on it, in my feeling. Do you, do, does that make sense? How, how do you present something that a, a cultural item that has a value that's that's intangible to a society that, because of a recession, is obsessed with having a price tag on everything? Right. Well, I think what's interesting is that you're trying to put a tangible price tag on something intangible. So either in a recession, someone says, you know, art is really important and I'm going to keep making work, as opposed to like making work that they're trying to sell to make money on. So that, that's one yeah, and I'm agreeing with Paul too, and that I, I think that there that um, the society, society is currently saying that this does not have value. Why make it? So, do you know what I mean? I, I think it's really tricky. I think some of it is out there um, about the work itself, and I, I do think that um, living in New York and having just had the the Sandy Storm happen, I do think that that the role of art or the role of um, things that aren't necessary ebbs and flows. Like, this reminds me of the argument to cancel the New York City Marathon because they should take all the generators and give them to people who are recovering from the storm. It's, it's like there's a time and a place for art to flourish and that requires some social stability and prosperity. And so there's some truth in that. I guess for me, I also think that when there's a recession, there's also a tremendous amount of creativity because people feel like they have less to lose and they're able to make the work without feeling like they have to get paid for the work. But yeah, if you're trying to make work and get paid for it, that's definitely harder to do directly in a recession. And there are many different strategies for going about that. One strategy is just to act as if and to make sure your work is really high quality and to try to price it, um, not according to what it costs you to make, but make a case for the value of the work to other people. And doing that, to me, requires a high degree of intellectual empathy. It requires really being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And I think sometimes people are exceptionally good at doing that, and sometimes people um, believe that the world owes them a livelihood for their creative work. And I want the world to owe everyone a livelihood for their creative work, but I also know people who became tax accountants instead of artists because they were afraid of not making a living, and I don't want to penalize those people either. I don't. I don't mean that to sound harsh. I like. I. I. I want. Um, I think Josh said a lot of good stuff in the last segment about how to get work out there and to really like build a story and find support for it and find people who can tell the story for you. And you know, in that case, I think um, 
all the really basic nuts and bolts stuff like asking for LinkedIn testimonials and endorsements, those things would actually really matter. You know, one of the adages that I repeat a lot to people in the course is to dream bigger, you know, yeah. and, and, to, and to dream big. And then the other thing that I'm realizing tonight is that being first is frequently important, you know, and that the one who establishes the paradigm, the, the Roger Bannisters are more important than whomever it was who came afterwards, we don't remember. Wes Santos. Who? I said Wes Santos, but I think, or John Landy. But See what I mean? <laughs> but I'm impressed that you knew that much. Does anybody want to ask another question of Amy or, or comment? Please do. I could call on my old standbys with no stuff. Yeah, Laura, go ahead. Um, okay, uh, I just figured I'd jump in on the uh, being first um, conversation. And um, so I, I think that's true, but uh, would, how would you feel? I guess I'm, I'm sort of uh, in a pessimistic moment at right now where I feel like um, it's almost impossible for me to be first at anything because so much has happened and the best I can do is put a new spin on it. And so what would you guys say to, some, to, to that thought in yeah, terms of visual art because so much has happened? Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's pretty fair. I think um, novelty for the sake of novelty doesn't really work. And I would say more um, just Going off of that energy, I think a lot of people feel that way right now. I mean, I think we're in a little bit of a low ebb. And um, I think that um, trying to get your art to talk to that feeling um, might actually be um, the kind of first first mover moment. I, I guess um, there's there's a quotation from Rob Storr. Do you guys know Rob Storr? He was a curator of contemporary art at MoMA for a long time. He's the dean of the School of Art at Yale, and he is trained as a painter. He's a very, very brilliant man. Um, he said once in an essay about Bruce Nauman's work that um, the uh, essential questions are constant, which is to say it's not about novelty. It's about um, the essential questions are constant insofar as they concern life and death and love and hatred and verifiable truth and gnawing existential doubt. But in order for them to maintain their urgency and their resonance, they are in constant need of concise and exacting restatement. So I guess the question is not, like being a first mover isn't really about reinventing the wheel. Being the first mover is about being present enough to be able to kind of cogently summarize where we all are. And so if that's where you are, like being first doesn't mean you have to like win a race. I, I think that that is a very um, kind of classical economic idea, right? That you're, you're always competing, you're never cooperating and you have to win. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the um, most interesting work could come out of like trying to perfectly encapsulate what it is that you're feeling and that's a form of being first it's just a lot more subjective it's a lot of being first is to have confidence in yourself to do what rings your bells you know to do what resonates yeah it's and more you feel like an idiot most of the time if you're doing something first but you probably feel like an idiot most of the time if you're trying to encapsulate why you think being first is is really difficult I mean, like when I started this course, nobody had ever done, you know, dealt with visual arts or teaching online. I mean, I don't know. I'm certain there were people who are doing webinars before me, but not in the visual arts. You know, when I began this, I didn't see, I mean, now you have a whole lot of universities that are doing, you know, online education. And at the time I started this, I feel like people were just talking about it. And then I've come to realize that, you know, having sort of been first, it's not sufficient to sit there and rest on your laurels. And that you've got, you know, that if you are not competing with what you've accomplished or trying to surpass it, somebody else is going to. Yeah. So that you've got to, you know, keep keep pushing the things that, you know, resonate. And you just can't sit there and go, oh, how nice right. that is. Um, right. Yeah. A Andy, you had a good question. Go ahead, Andy. Ask it. Andy, are you there? He just muted himself. I'm, I've unmuted you. 
and you've remuted. Let me do it. Let me do it. Okay, go ahead. You got it. Andy, go ahead. All right, I'm just going to read your question, and we're not. You, you don't get to talk. Sorry, dude. She says her thoughts on branding oneself in the sense of marketing, and is knowing your lighthouse the same as knowing your audience? Is knowing your lighthouse? Um, it could be, yeah. And and do I have something to say on on branding yourself and marketing your work? I don't know. It's an incomplete sentence, so I'm going to Andy. If if you can talk, go ahead. And if you can't, we're going to guess. Okay, he's on a phone call, so I don't know what happened there or not. So, um, so what do you think about branding oneself in, in a marketing sense? Um, yeah, I think that um, I I guess I'm always a little bit old fashioned and naive, and think that um, I don't believe that, by the way. I know people people use the term brand in a way that sounds very superficial, like you're not being who you are; you're deciding to be this veneer of a person and that that's not so appealing but i do think that the the world is so complicated that people need an ability to understand who you are and having some sort of way of encapsulating what matters to you succinctly is is important and that is what a brand is I mean, a brand is a shorthand way of understanding someone so i think that matters i guess i i think that um like People are really sensitive, like art collectors, gallerists, patrons. I think people are really sensitive to feeling like they're being approached and being sold. Increasingly, people are so sophisticated about when they're being sold that I actually, I actually think a lot of people succeed on the basis of being genuinely nice and having genuine interest in other people. Like I know artists like that; they make excellent work, but they're also lovely to be around, and they. They have a brand or they network and market their work, but they do it also out of a genuine interest in other people, and I, I think that that actually really helps them. I think being genuine is a good strategy. <laughs> I do too. Yeah, I mean, it's great. No, totally. If you, were, if you were trying to game the system, I would try to be as genuine as possible. Yeah. yeah. It's like my favorite quote. Somebody once asked George Burns, the secret to acting, he said, sincerity. If you can fake yeah, that, you've yeah. got it made. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, that, exactly, exactly. But, you know, I look for sincerity. I don't look for people who are faking it. I look for people who come across as being sincere, and I want their art to be sincere, and I want them to be sincere. Let me ask you this, and perhaps it's the last question. Um, I'm wondering how important it is to know yourself or if it's more important to accept yourself. I, is it possible to accept yourself without knowing yourself? Yeah, probably, because when you start putting something and breaking new ground with the endeavor to be who you are, you don't necessarily know who it is you are. You're just right. putting it out there in the universe and seeing what happens. Right. But you've, got to, but, but you've got to be comfortable with the process of doing that, and that it's an extension of you for it to have any chance, I think. Well, when you, when you put it that way, it, it makes it sound like knowing yourself is a form of judging yourself and then saying to yourself that you're okay. So that would be being outside yourself, judging that you're okay, and then saying that you're okay, whereas accepting yourself is just a form of kind of being comfortable in your own skin. Yeah. And I think the latter is more important. I think trying – I I certainly, when I'm trying to make creative work or write, I, I feel like the conversation I'm having is how to get the one ring inside my head that goes one way to line up with the other ring that goes the other way. So there's some moment of still and some moment of just kind of being present. And that that's the moment of feeling comfortable in your own skin. It's not a moment of being like, okay, I'm fine with where I am in life, or I, you know, am okay that I'm interested in making this work or that work. It's it's just a like fundamental form of um, showing up. So I I guess yeah, I do feel like that is um, it's the hardest thing to do. Uh, it's I think it's easier in a way, or there's a feeling of being in control. If you set this goal, and the goal might not be the art, the goal might be making money or getting representation by a gallery. It's very easy to put that kind of existential crisis out into the world and make it external and feel like if only I could do this, then my life would make sense. And a lot of the success that I've seen happen where people find those things, they don't find them because they're looking for them directly. They find them by a form of secular grace 
that happens by effort um, that somehow when they're not paying attention leads, leads to an outcome that they would want. And that's the hardest thing because it requires really hard work and total uncertainty. This is really cool. Um, does anybody else have a question they'd like to ask Amy before we um, wrap this up? I don't see anybody's hands up. Anybody? Um, is there anything that you want to say that, you know, like the thoughts you had before we began, the things that you wanted to make sure we covered? Um, this is it. This is, is there anything, you know, you can't write me tomorrow and say, oh, I wish I'd said thus and such. This is it. This is your yeah, chance. I, no, I, I think I said a lot of the stuff that I thought about saying and that we talked about um, going over beforehand. Um, I guess um, the main thing I would say is that is just to be encouraging, just to totally honor. I can't see and hear everyone on the call, but just to totally honor that you're showing up for this, that you're making work and that your work will get out into the world. And I also think um, the art world is broader than it's ever been. Um, there, there are so many ways that people are all connected, that we are all connected. There's so much work being seen in New York, everywhere, from all over, to all over. And um, I just, I really hope that one day I go into a museum and see work um, and, or meet one of you guys and know that you were on the call. And I guess um, I would say to you the thing that it sounds really dull and not that exciting, but it, I think it's the highest compliment that you can pay to an artist, which is you're not crazy, carry on. Um, I really <laughs> hope you guys just carry on, like keep on keeping on. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to, to join your conversation. Fabulous. Amy, thank you very much. I think you've challenged and simultaneously honed our thinking. I mean, I'm sure you've challenged and honed my thinking, and that doesn't happen either one all that often and simultaneously just about never. So I think this has been really fabulous. Let me unmute all everybody so that we can echo that ensemble. Me, thank you a ton. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy.